a cookie cutter plan, uh, but some practical principles that you can uh, adapt and, and implement as, as you think is best. Um, the principle that I've observed churches operating under when it comes to stewardship education uh, most often over the years is uh, what I affectionately call the moose principle, which is based on the story of two hunters who went up in the Canadian wilderness to hunt moose. Uh, they chartered a little one-engine plane uh, that took them out onto the tundra, and zoomed in, came to the end of the little run runway, pilot drops off the two hunters and says, okay guys, uh, happy hunting, I'll see you in a week uh, on this spot, and remember I can take the two of you and one moose. So zzz, buzzes, the plane buzzes off. A week later, the plane comes back in, and there are the two hunters at the end of the runway with two enormous moose. And the pilot stops the plane, looks at him, and says, guys, I told you, this is a little plane, one engine. I can take the two of you and one moose. And the hunters are crestfallen. And they said, well, oh, we slogged through the mud and the snow to bag these two moose. Our families are never going to believe we actually got two if we don't bring them both back. And they said, and besides, last year we were in a plane of exactly the same size and the pilot let us take two moose. Well, the pilot says, okay, if he let you do it last year, I guess we can do it this year. So two, pilot, uh, two hunters, two moose pile in the plane and off they go and it just shudders down the runway, just barely lifts off, just clears the trees and <laughs> into the side of the mountain. Airplane everywhere, moose everywhere. And these two hunters stagger out of the wreckage and one looks around in a daze and says, where are we? And the other one looks and he says, well, I think we got about a half a mile farther than we did last year. <laughs> and all too often in my experience when I talk to people about, about stewardship education, that's their response. Um, we're going to do what we did last year. Well, how did that work for you? Well, not so good. Um, you know, we didn't really get lift off. We crashed and burned on takeoff, but, but you know, we're going to do it again. And I think God has something much better for us if we'll uh, deal first and foremost with leadership. So here are some practical principles. Number one, there is communicated leadership. The stewardship commitment of the congregation will never exceed the communicated stewardship commitment of the clergy and vestry. Uh, there is a leadership principle uh, in the body of Christ and I think in human society in general, namely we follow our leaders. The leadership commitment of the clergy and vestry will function as a lid on the commitment of the congregation. Now, I think that's true, especially in, in the area of stewardship, but it's not only true in the area of stewardship. Uh, you could I could suggest that the, the commitment to personal discipleship and, and uh, the reading of scripture and prayer of the, of the leadership will function as a lid on the commitment of the congregation. Now, there'll always be individuals who will far out, outstrip us, uh, but as a whole, as a community, we follow our leaders. That's just the way societies operate. And in the body of Christ, the leadership commitment is crucial. That's why in the New Testament, there is such emphasis on the spiritual and character qualifications of leaders because the body of Christ follows its leaders. So there are two aspects of this commitment. Number one, the clergy are committed to giving out of thankfulness with the biblical tithe as the minimum standard for their own giving. This is a huge challenge for, uh, for us who are clergy. Uh, there's a lot at stake in our own leadership. Uh, sometimes clergy recoil at this and think somehow it's unfair <laughs> that we have this expectation uh, of, of our own commitment and our own leadership, but it's the way it is. Uh, a college professor was giving his uh, final exam to one of his large uh, four or 500 student lecture classes. 
And as he distributed the exam, he announced that this exam uh, will last two hours. At the end of two hours, you will turn in your exam. There will be no additional time. I will not accept late papers. Two hours on the nose, you may begin. So they all write feverishly. Two hours goes by, he calls time. Uh, they all finish. They come forward and put their papers in this huge stack on his desk, except one guy sitting toward the back who keeps writing feverishly, writing, writing, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Finally, he finishes and comes up. The professor stops him and says, I said two hours, no extensions. You're late. I will not accept your exam. Oh, you know, he's really upset. Uh, he says, no, I will not accept your exam. You get a zero. At which point the student pulls himself up and says, Professor, do you know who I am? And the professor says, no, I don't. And the student said, great, and shoved his exam in the middle of the pile. <laughs> <laughs> My experience is that you know, it, leadership is, is great until there are those kinds of, of, of expectations, and then we want to hide in the middle of the pile. But the Lord has called us to a place of leadership in the body of Christ. Now, let me be clear. I do not believe that clergy are held to a higher standard than others in the body of Christ. I do believe, however, that we are held more accountable to the same standard. Because we're in orders and under vows, there is greater accountability to the biblical calls of the committed Christian life. But it's not a different standard. It's a greater accountability to the same standard. I said that the clergy are committed to their giving out of their own thankfulness with the biblical tithe as the standard for their own giving. The word I used in the, pre, at the, the, the overall commitment is about the communicated stewardship commitment of the clergy and vestry. Uh, the first step is for the clergy to be committed. The second step is for the clergy to be open about their commitment. I learned something about the importance of that early in my teaching about this. I, I was very excited about what God was doing in my life in the area of, of biblical stewardship, and I began to share it. And as you heard, I was asked to work with 167 churches, so I got a lot of invitations to come and meet with vestries. And I met with a vestry and shared about this. I didn't really know what I was doing, except I was just committed and excited. And they were pretty energized. They were quite responsive and said, you know, just jabbering around the vestry table, you know, we've not heard this before. This is tremendous. How do we learn about this? How can we communicate this to our people? And on and on and on. And at that point, after the, while the, the rector uh, got everybody quiet, and he said, um, I've served as your rector for 29 years. I've married many of you, I've baptized your children, um, and I'm now nearing retirement. And at this point, at the end of my ministry, I have come to see tonight for the very first time how much I have failed you as your priest. He said, because I have been a tither for 44 years and I don't think I've ever told a soul in this church how much it means to me. And that night, I did business with the Lord and said that I'm going to be willing, Lord, to tell people what you are doing in my life. Uh, I do not want to fail to, to lead the people that you give me to serve. That doesn't mean, of course, being up front and complaining about how they don't give us enough money, but rather giving testimony to our, to our own giving. I think clergy often fail to talk about giving because first, some of us have been told that it is a virtue not to talk about money, uh, but to have instead have lay people talk about it. As you'll hear, I'm all for having lay people talk about stewardship, no question about that, but not instead of the clergy in addition to the clergy. I often encourage people to when they think about stewardship, financial stewardship education in the parish, try substituting a different word, uh, 
a different aspect of discipleship and see how it sounds. Try substituting, say, prayer. And as in, oh, in our church, the clergy don't talk about prayer. We have lay people do that. Uh, I'd wonder what was going on in the prayer life of the, of the, of the priest um, or what wasn't going on in the prayer life of the priest. Um, clergy need to be, to be up front. And some of us were actually taught in seminary and other places that it was ideal if we never spoke about it and had other people do it instead. So that's one of the reasons clergy failed to talk about it. Sometimes, indeed, it's because uh, we haven't dealt with it in our own lives. And so we really don't want to, uh, to be open about that. We don't want to stir that up. Sometimes clergy see it as self-serving to talk about money since they see so much of the congregation's giving goes to their own salary. But again, it's not about raising the budget. It's about our need to give. Uh, and we ourselves need to give every bit as much as everyone else. Sometimes I see clergy as uh, resentful of the income of some of their parishioners. Um, oftentimes the clergy will be aware that on a much more modest salary are among the, the highest givers in the church. And they're wise enough to know that speaking about money out of anger and resentment is not a very good basis for preaching and better to just be quiet about the whole subject. Uh, sometimes people think that a silent witness is sufficient. Um, I remember working with a, with a vestry and, and talking about the importance of clergy leadership and clergy preaching and teaching about their own, uh, including their own testimony and their own giving. And the rector said very openly to the vestry, well, I think my commitment is clear. I think people know that I'm committed and I don't think I really need to talk about this. I think I've been very uh, you know, clear by my example. And at which point the junior warden turned to the rector, it just spontaneously said, you mean you give to the church? So much for the silent witness. Um, there is a need for us to be, to be up front. If the clergy won't talk about this, won't be open about it, I have to say I don't think much is going to happen. And I'll say this to uh, lay leaders here. Um, if your priest won't deal with this and won't teach about it, um, you're not really expected to lead uh, instead. Uh, I don't think you're, I want to get you off the hook, if you will, to not feel somehow culpable and responsible if you're not sh joined in that leadership uh, by, your, by your clergy. Uh, the clergy need to be upfront and deal with this. If it's a matter of beginning to introduce this, this subject to the congregation, I think numerous uh, sermons on, a, on an ongoing basis are, are needed. Uh, I think we clergy vastly overestimate the impact of one sermon and vastly underestimate the impact of, say, half a dozen sermons. Uh, to put it in another context, um, I bet you a church, at a church like the Falls Church, John Yates didn't once preach a sermon on biblical authority back in 1980, and that was that. No, when that church was led to a deep commitment to the authority of Scripture, I'm sure there was lots of repeated teaching uh, about that subject to build that into the fabric of the life of the church and its teaching and in the hearts of, of the people. Now, having done that for many, many years, it's probably not necessary to, to, to replow that foundational ground nearly as often. Uh, but there's still, I'm sure, a great effort to bring uh, people into that understanding and conviction as they come into the life of that, of that church. Uh, there is tremendous power uh, when we're willing to share our own testimony and our own experience. Uh, one of the most powerful stewardship sermons I ever heard of, I didn't get to hear it, was um, after one of these kinds of workshops. I've done a lot of these kind of diocesan events, and I did one, and a priest came to me, and he was really convicted about not having dealt with this first in his own life and not having really talked about it um, in his congregation. 
and said, you know, what can I do? I don't have a testimony. I, I, I don't really understand this yet, um, but I've just, the Lord's convicted me that um, I need to make some serious changes. And, and I looked at him and I said, why don't you get up tomorrow and say exactly that? And I think he thought it would kill him. <laughs> um, but it was actually one of the most powerful things he ever did. Uh, not the kind of thing you want to do every week, but what he did was get up and tell what had happened and what God had done in his heart. And said, you know, he asked, openly asked people's forgiveness for not having dealt with this and taught about it as he should. Uh, said, I'm, my wife and I are going to deal with this, and we, the Lord has, has made it clear that this is what he's calling me to, and I invite you to come explore this with me, and we're going to learn this together. Uh, tremendously gracious, humble, and powerful act of leadership. Um, authenticity and transparency is a great way to lead. Um, you know, we don't have to pretend we're anywhere other than where we are. Um, but our people are not going to leapfrog over us and, um, and march off into the sunset of spiritual commitment, leaving their leaders behind. Um, I would regularly give my personal testimony some version of what I offered this morning, pretty much every year in one way or another. Um, I wanted people to know how important this is to me, uh, that this is central to my life and discipleship, and I just would be ready to tell people. There are some people in this congregation, the people here, who can tell my story better than I can because they've heard it so many times. But it's the only story I've got, so I just keep offering it. Um, but I think it's tremendously important for the clergy to be uh, open, upfront, and, and really plowing this, this new area of discipleship for your people if it's something that hasn't been talked about regularly and, and, and openly. Part B of this is all members of the vestry are committed to giving out of thankfulness with the biblical tithe as the minimum standard for their own giving. Um, I think a key uh, step for the, for the vestry, for the lay leadership, is a clearly articulated, signed uh, stewardship statement, signed by every member of the vestry. Uh, committing to the biblical tithe, uh, everyone may not be tithing, and may not be tithing tomorrow, but if they have come to the place where they are committed to the biblical tithe, they see that as normative in their life, and they are either tithing or on a, a sincere plan to, to to reach the tithe, uh, I think that is an extraordinarily powerful statement to the congregation. Uh, not much happens if the clergy are not on board and leading, but frankly, a lot of won't. A lot of times, not much will happen if only the clergy are on board. Um, on the one hand, people say, if this were important, the rector would be talking about it, and on the other hand, people say, well, he's paid to talk about this stuff. <laughs> and it can be dismissive, but um, not every member of the congregation knows and relates to every member of the vestry, but just about every active member of the congregation knows at least somebody on the vestry that they feel connected to and close to and respect and, and, and know their heart. And when they see that every member of the vestry is leading in this area, it gets people's attention. Um, I think it's important to wrestle with it as a vestry until you come to that place of agreement. I, I mean, entirely too many things in the church have been passed on eight to four votes and never heard from again. Uh, but you can imagine the conversation at coffee hour when there's some discussion about tithing. What? Hey, Bill, what's this tithing thing the vestry's been talking about? Oh, don't ask me. I didn't vote for it. <laughs> you know, and you know, where are we then? Um, I've worked with vestries for months and months and months, even years, to help them come to that place of, of a commitment. And, and it needs to be a meaningful one. I'm not talking about auditing people's 1040 forms, um, but I am talking about a transparent, open, sincere sharing of where people really are with their giving. Uh, this kind of statement became popular uh, a number of years ago, and some groups latched on to it and passed it. All in favor, sign the statement, say aye, aye, <clears throat> yeah, good, close enough, and, and that was that. I mean, I actually came in to work with some vestries that 
uh, had adopted stewardship statements until I got there, and then when I got finished, they didn't have one anymore because I got them to really talk about it, and people who'd signed a statement for years, when they finally got asked, said, oh, I don't believe that, I don't do it, I'm not going to. Well, you can imagine that that kind of you know, pur purported statement of leadership wasn't really having much spiritual effect. It's got to be real, and it takes some time. And it, you need an opportunity for people, whether it's on a retreat or at a, at, at a vestry meeting pretty much devoted to that, you have time to really talk and share and, and pray, do some Bible study, and come to a meaningful commitment. Again, if you have the perspective that the commitment of the congregation is not going to exceed the commitment of the clergy and lay leadership, then you don't want to shortcut the process of helping that group uh, come to a deeper place of commitment because you're not going to take the church farther than you're taking the leaders. Uh, so you really want to plow deep with that, with that team because the way the kingdom works, it's just the, the mystical way of, of God's kingdom. If you take them deeper, the congregation will, uh, will be enabled to, to come along with them. Um, for a lot of churches, and I know uh, this one, uh, when that commitment to the tithe was clear by the leadership for, for uh, several years, uh, it then became added as a criterion for nomination to vestry. Uh, in other words, the, the vestry's commitment was not put up for grabs every year. In other words, the vestry's committed this year, but we'll see who we elect next year. Maybe we won't be committed next year. We believe in the authority of Scripture this year. We'll see who we believe in it next year. You know, that, no. You know, you, it's not just when we did it once, but when there's a consistent sense of leadership and the commitment of the, of the, of the congregation, then it's realistic for the congregation to say, and we, we want to raise up people who share this commitment uh, that we affirm as a, as a church. And particularly when you're giving the vestry the responsibility for uh, making decisions about the tithes of other people, uh, you put people in a really untenable situation when they're in effect asking for a commitment from others they're not prepared to make themselves. That's a, that's a, that's a hypocritical thing to do that understandably people end up feeling pretty uncomfortable with. They may not be able to articulate it, but that's, but that's what's going on. All right, vestry leadership, clergy and vestry leadership first. Number two, uh, the budget is not presented as the basis for giving. Pledges are not sought to meet the budget. The focus on tithing means that we are asked by the Lord to determine our giving as a percentage of what we earn this year, not basing our giving simply on what we gave last year. My experience is that the tithe is sufficiently challenging that people will often look for almost any other basis upon which to make their decision about their giving instead of the tithe. And the most obvious one is, I'll give the same I gave last year. The second most obvious is, I will give and maybe change my giving in relationship to how the budget is changing. Um, the, the problem with that is that it's not helping people um, honor bi the biblical call and to give as they have been blessed by the Lord. Asking parish, a, a, a not atypical scenario is the church has, I'll just pick random numbers, a uh, $100,000 budget. And the vestry crunches the numbers and they really want to be frugal. We need to do some more things. We don't want to do any more than we have to. Money's tight. But we're, we need $111,000 next year. And so some well-intentioned person gets up and explains that next year the budget needs to go up 11%. And the clear message given to everybody implicitly is please increase your pledge by 11%. The problem is that that is almost guaranteed not to be a helpful guide for anybody in the congregation. If you think at both extremes. On the one hand, suppose you have some um, executive 
uh, who's making $300,000 a year and writes an annual check to the church for $100. You just asked him for $111. And he'll probably give it to you thinking he's now done his fair share in everything the church has asked. On the other hand, there's the stereotypical poor tithing widow who is, in terms of real cost to them, is probably the most generous person in your church who isn't going to get an 11% raise next year and will probably feel guilty that she's not doing what you asked. As soon as the budget is presented with a bottom line, draw the line, this is it, this is all, we, we need this much, but this is all we need, we, we're giving people an alternative basis for their giving other than the tithe. And my experience is that if people find that to be a more convenient, comfortable, and lower standard, they will be quick to grab on it. I remember it used to have a couple people who were um, persistent in the fall in asking me how many families we had in the church. And I could never quite get it until finally I, it, the penny dropped and I realized that what they were doing was figuring out, taking the size of the church budget and dividing it by the number of families to come up with their fair share. And I've told that story a number of times to, to clergy and I've had so many clergy go, oh, I've got one of those too. And, and we, the point is that we just will constantly look for some human standard other than a, than a biblical one. Um, I'm not saying that we cannot offer uh, a, a, a proposed budget. Um, some churches do that. I would suggest to you that if you do a proposed budget, that before you do the pledges, that you do it with utmost prayer, that this is what God is calling us to do, that you include in it a vision for mission, and that if possible, you actually don't draw a bottom line because there are two aspects of the budget. The aspect that everybody in effect would like to keep at a minimum level, and that's the overhead and administrative costs and things like that. No one thinks that it's great. Look how much we're spending on copying this year. I mean, everybody wants to be frugal and good, of course. But when it comes to the mission of the church and outreach or planting churches or serving the poor or whatever it is, there's no bottom line there. There's no limit. You know, no one will say, if, if you give us this much money, that's all that God could ever use for the work of the kingdom. Don't give us another. Ne of course not. But frankly, as soon as you draw that, that line, add it up and say, this is all we need. We need this much. But by implication, this is all we need. You, you give that message. And then we're back to the people who the, sometimes the most generous people will not invest their tithe in the like, life of the church because they see that there isn't that call and vision for, uh, for mission. I mean, frankly, if you imagine that uh, executive that I talked about who heard the call to tithe to say go from a $100 gift to the church to $30,000 gift to the church, uh, and they saw the church budget was going up um, $2,114, and that's all the churches need, I'm sure that person's response would be, well, I'm going to give that tithe elsewhere because the church doesn't want it, doesn't need it. So I think you understand what I'm trying to say, that the, um, it, you don't want to present the budget in any way to, to limit what God wants to do in and through the church. I personally feel it is more helpful to state goals uh, for mission and, uh, and ministry uh, rather than a specific budget and craft the budget after people have made their commitments about their giving. Um, because when people, uh, when you, if you move to that, the response that people will often give is, if you don't give me the budget, how will we know how much to give? And the answer to that is, I'm sure glad you asked that question. Let me tell you about the tithe. <laughs> because that's the basis by which we know how much, if you will, the Lord is calling us to give. Uh, and not having a budget makes it easier to direct people's attention to the biblical call to tithe and off the issue of have we met the budget or how much do I have to give to help us meet the budget. Um, 
This is not an absolute, this is not a biblical um, principle. I'm just trying to encourage you to, to deal with the budget in a way that doesn't unwittingly undermine your biblical teaching uh, by implying, yes, we teach the tithe, but what we really want is to meet the budget, and here's how much we need from you. Um, and I think that really does, um, does undermine the, uh, the tithe. Mission goals, I think, are, real, are very, very helpful. Uh, not simply projecting how much you think you can get out of people or how much you think they realistically can give, but here is the, here is the goal and the priority. And that can be our, our, our mission goal is to hire a youth pastor. Uh, our mission goal could be to plant a church. Our mission goal could be on a outreach on a percentage basis to, to give more away. Um, the, the budget is not the ultimate driver. Um, Obviously, you want to balance the budget. You don't want to be crying poor and manipulating people and during the year. But you also don't want to um, set such a low bar that you actually discourage people from giving, uh, from giving to mission. Third, there's a commitment to increase the percentage of the budget for mission outreach outside the congregation with the goal of 50-50 giving. This is not a legalism. I am not gonna to go to the mat over 50%. It's not explicit biblical teaching, though it's fair to say it's loosely based on the love your neighbor as yourself. To, it's not about cutting the budget in half and giving half away. It's in effect challenging people as they give to raise up a second budget for mission. Um, that, that one of the reasons we look at 50-50 is that usually 10% is far too little. Uh, the tithe is really a personal standard, not a corporate standard. And so um, our, our experience is in our culture that churches giving away uh, outside themselves only 10% of their budget um, is not nearly challenging enough. Uh, I know African bishops who know us well who say Americans ought to keep 10% and give away 90%. Um, for the work of mission around the world. Now, I don't know any church that does that, but um, I know Church of the Apostles in Truro uh, Church inspired us in this area uh, with early on and uh, with, with commitments and experience of 50-50 giving. Uh, we moved close to that over a long period of time uh, at All Saints. It's a tremendously exciting thing. and. My experience is that people come to see the church as kind of a Christian unite, uh, united, uh, what is it, combined federal campaign, uh, united way thing where people give together and see the Lord do extraordinary things through the church corporately beyond what individuals can do who often feel like, well, I'm just writing a check to a large organization, but here together we're able to pray and discern how our church is called into mission and make significant um, impact for, uh, for the Lord. I think it's important not to characterize what we give away as somehow good and what is spent on the ministry within the congregation as bad. I don't think that's the case at all. I think what we do within the life of the church is good. If it's not, you shouldn't be doing it at all, regardless of what percentage it is. People always say, well, what's the definition of outreach? Genuinely, I do not care. The point is simply to have a measuring rod, and that is to say, don't monkey with the definition every year so that you can just keep track of where you are. Most churches don't know how much they give away as a percentage of their budget just as a lot of individuals have no idea what percentage of their income they're, they're giving away to the Lord. And it's extraordinarily helpful because I've seen a number of churches that where the budgets have grown significantly and they say, oh yeah, we're giving more and more to outreach. And when you look at the actual numbers, the percentage of their budget that's going for missions is declining, 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 declining. As their means increases, uh, they've kidded themselves by simply looking at the raw numbers without looking at, at percentages. Uh, the simple goal is to give, I think, again, more and more away uh, for missions. Uh, not because there's an uh, uh, arbitrary magic number to reach, but because God's calling us to, to deeper mission and deeper, and deeper discipleship. Um, 
as I was saying, it, 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 it matters less to me whether a church includes their giving to, say, the diocese or certain organizations or whatever it is, or not. The issue, because God's not fooled. It's not like we're trying to convince God we're more generous than we thought. That What the percentage is is less important, but stick with it. Because I remember having conversations where people said, well, you know, we let our church be used by outside groups, and I've calculated that 3.2% of the electric bill really is outreach, and we should get credit for that. But again, the issue is not backing up and getting credit uh, as if somehow we're more generous because we've recalculated the percentage. That's not the point. The point is just adopt a, a simple, workable uh, approach, and then it allows you to have a benchmark so you can see how you're, how you're doing. Um, number four, there are identified mission goals for the congregation based on answering the question, what is Jesus Christ calling our church to do? This is um, very much the kind of thing I spoke about earlier. I won't, I won't belabor it, uh, but it is helpful to look beyond ourselves. Um, a lot of churches have...